Thank you to these companies and organizations that make the Before I Die New Mexico Festival possible. A good goodbye, Gail Rubin, puts the fun in funeral planning. Compassion and choices, improving care, expanding options, and empowering everyone to chart their end of life journey. Daniel's Family Funerals and Cremations, Fairview Memorial Park, Gabaldon Mortuary, Sandia Memory Gardens, and Vista Verde Memorial Park, all in the Albuquerque area. Estate Pros, offering professional dispersal of personal possessions due to a move, illness, or death. The Final Exit Network, educating about and defending the right to choose at end of life. French Funerals and Cremations and Sunset Memorial Park in Albuquerque. Gathering Us, providing in-person and virtual memorial services and online memorial pages. Keeper, providing hybrid and virtual memorial services and keeping memories alive with online tributes to preserve, celebrate, and share life legacies. Morris Hall, estate planning attorneys in New Mexico and Arizona. Remembering a Life, your guide to honoring a life well-lived from planning a tribute to mourning a loved one. And Retirement Extender, investment management services with a personalized strategy recommendation based on your needs and objectives. Welcome to this session about the art and craft of excellent obituary writing. I am so pleased to have Petra Lina Orloff, who is the founder of Beloved, an obituary and eulogy writing service. I met Petra at a um, funeral director convention when she had set up her booth and launched her business. And I was like, you go, girl. <laughs> She's She's doing some amazing things, and she is a professional writer herself. She heads up a team of other writers that work with her at Beloved. And we're going to learn what goes into writing an excellent obituary. So please welcome Petra. Good to see you. Well, thank you for having me here. It's always a pleasure to speak at this festival in particular. Um, I like when people are planning ahead and not waiting till the last minute. So um, this Amen. is wonderful. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do um, at first is I'll, I'll just introduce myself and, and then I wanna, I wanna talk to some of the other people who, have, uh, who are here for this particular session. Um, as Gail mentioned, I do have a company called Beloved. We uh, write custom creative um, obituaries and eulogies. Um, and I have a team of writers and uh, we work with both the public and also through funeral homes. I have been a professional writer myself for, oh gosh, I'm dating myself, but 30 plus years. So um, I, I, I've been doing this for quite a while and all of our writers are professional as well. Um, I also used to teach at a university here in Detroit and um, a freelance writer. And I got the idea to, um, to do this when I started getting more and more um, calls to, uh, to write obituaries for people. And I thought perhaps this was a service that, that could be utilized throughout the industry. So um, that is how Beloved started. Um, and what I would like to do just before we begin, um, I'd like to sort of go through I see a few people that we have with us, and and if the, if the, everyone here, including those from Gathering Us, would participate, um, I, I I would certainly appreciate it. If if we could just go through and somebody, uh, uh, well, all of you will tell me just one thing about yourself that makes you, that makes you unique or that's extraordinary about your life. Um, and if I'm looking at my computer correctly. Why don't we start with Gail and then we'll go to, to Lauren after that. What makes me unique? Well, hey, I'm the doyen of death. Right. <laughs> and 
And that means people ask, what's a doyen? And I say, it's a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject. Uh, although I, you know, I was not the doyen of death my entire life, but when I look back at my, my career starting at the University of Maryland in film and television and communications, uh, one of the things that I recognize is in a film production class, I did a satire of Ingmar Bergman's classic film, The Seventh Seal, where a medieval knight um, challenges death to a game of chess uh, on a beach at dawn. And when I look at that, I realize, oh my God, I am doing what I was always meant to do, which is to make fun of death with films and get people to plan ahead. So uh, that's what makes me unique. Um, thank you. And I, I love that you use that film in particular. It's a great one. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's something you didn't tell about you that you're you're a cultural uh, uh, I wouldn't say expert, but uh, you're very well versed in the. Oh, yeah, I used to teach cultural studies and and film studies at at the university as well. So, yeah, we have that in common. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes, very much so. Um, Lauren, would you mind, please? I think one of the things I've always said about myself is I'm always like right brain, left brain, right from college. It was like communications with a minor in math and I get to working in entertainment, but in finance. And so I feel like I'm still, I would always say I'm unique <laughs> that I translate between worlds, you know, whatever that means. And so right now that means translating between kind of the human aspect of you know, bringing communities together and the technology of making that happen. But I always find that I, I'm always on these the cusps, like in between things, whatever that means, you know? So as I keep switch, as my life goes on, I keep switching what I'm doing from a finance job to a marketing job to running this business. But it's always with this idea that I like to translate between, you know, languages or business languages or worlds. Wonderful, like creative and pragmatic at the same time. Yes, fighting, <laughs> fighting themselves inside. It's a good combination though to have. <laughs> Um, can we go to, to Jana? Sure. Um, I am, would say that the unique thing about me in terms of my family, I am one of the few people in my family who left. I'm originally from Texas and I live in New York City now. I left Texas to go to uh, school out of state and stayed in New York City after I had lived here for four years. Um, and majored in film and television. And uh, uh, at the time, that was something that was considered, you might want to consider having something to fall back on. <laughs> Absolutely. So that, that basically is what makes me unique in my family. And I think as a person. What drew you to New York? Um, the, I just like the, uh, the schools that I could go to there. So I, I was considering NYU or School of Visual Arts, and then I kind of went more in art direction and picked School of Visual Arts. And financially too, that was the school I could afford. Oh. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure New York is, is happy to have you. I'm happy to be Texas here. This is you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I see Bob Hoffman. Can, can you tell me what it's, what's extraordinary or unique about you? Yes, I'd like to say that probably one of the things that's most unique and extraordinary about me is that I am the owner uh, of the largest collection in the world, as documented by uh, many, of a collection of handcrafted, originally designed boxes designed to hold a harmonica. Oh, wow. What brought this on? Uh, I was a harmonica player and wanted to have a fancy way to carry the harmonica, so I now have 500 individually personalized cases that I can wear around my neck, depending upon what my outfit is. And uh, it's internationally known. Oh, fantastic. Where do you perform? Uh, the collection performs in museums <laughs> and exhibitions all over the country. And I perform as needed in different shows. Oh, 
Oh, that is certainly unique. How did you get into harmonica playing though? I just started playing, but uh, the question really is, how did I get into harmonica cases? Because that's what makes me unique. You asked about unique. There are many, uh -huh. many harmonica players. There's only one that is the largest collector of harmonica cases in the world, and that's me. Better known as Hoff the Harmonica Case Man. Hoff the Harmonica Case Man. Look it up. It's on, it's all over the YouTube. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's that's fantastic. But you can't certainly use them all in one year. Like you have to really, like either you're, you know, wearing a few a day or or you're spreading it out? They're mostly now, they're used sparsely and exhibited greatly. Ah, well, good for you. That's wonderful. And it's certainly extraordinary and unique. Um, Sherry, can you please tell me uh, what makes you extraordinary? Um, Hello. I think the first thing that comes to mind is when I was in my 20s, I lived for six years as a Benedictine monk. And one of the reasons I bring that up in this particular conference is one of the tenets of Benedictine monasticism is that um, the monk should always keep death before his eyes. So I think that had a big influence on me in my 20s as far as maybe that's where the seed was planted, where I became sort of obsessed with death and dying culturally and spiritually and psychologically and everything. Um, so that's been a key, key factor in who I am. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, what made you, what brought you to that? Uh, <laughs> um, I think just in my early 20s, I think I was just doing a lot of searching, like for meaning. It's like, oh, I'm graduating from college, but but what kind of, like, I just didn't find things that really seemed like they gave me a lot of meaning. And so yeah. somehow I was drawn to this monastic lifestyle where I felt like um, it was all about finding meaning in life and finding, um, yeah, some sort of purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wonderful. That's very interesting. I, I've, I've certainly done a lot of reading in that area, but never, never lived the life. So good for you. Thanks. Um, I see Althea. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, can you tell yes. me what's extraordinary about yourself, please? I'm, I'm sort of like Gail. I stole her idea about the doyen of death and I'm the death maven. I have a trademark and ah. a, a maven, if for those who don't know, is an expert on something and mine is death. I'm a certified thanatologist and I've been involved in the death movement really since I saw Karen Ann Quinlan hooked up to um, life support for so many years, they just wouldn't let that poor girl die. And I think from that moment on, I really followed the death movement and choice in dying. I always thought Jack Kevor Kevorkian was a hero and um, not a He's, villain. He lived just down the street. Like I'm looking oh my out God. my window, I can see his house. Well, the house he used to live in. Yeah, <laughs> That's so cool. I imagine he seemed like kind of an oddball, but I mean, that just goes with the territory because I'm an yeah. oddball too. So um, that's that's pretty much it. I think if if I were to have an obituary written about myself, I think that's really what I want to be known for is helping people at the end of life. I counsel people and help them do advanced directives. And I'm also a final exit surrogate consultant. So. I, I combined a lot of different areas in my life under one umbrella, and that's the end of life movement and aid and dying and all of the above. And I think that's probably what makes me unique. Oh, wonderful. Well, we're lucky to have you here too as well. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> um, who do we have next? Uh, Dal and Pat Jensen. Uh, Looks like riding the edge of the universe out in space. Perhaps you could tell me what's extraordinary over there. My background for one thing. <laughs> it is extraordinary. You look fantastic. No, Pat and I are both, both watching you on the TV sets. Uh, so she don't, you don't get to see her uh, coming in across on my laptop. Uh, I don't know that we have anything quite as exciting as what's been going on. Uh, we both uh, are retired now, obviously. Um, 
I worked at Sandia for many years. And currently, if we can get back down to it, I volunteer at the library. Pat volunteers at the museum. And we both keep pretty busy doing those sorts of things right now. Um, Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Oh, we're also Janeites. I should have mentioned that. Uh, both of well, us. you're in the right place because I am too. Fantastic. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and uh, but other than that, uh, we were just pretty interested in seeing what happens today, and get some information so we can proceed. Wonderful. I have a statement here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, I think this is my my philosophy. If you have a dream, you can build it. Because yes. we have built a dream. Oh, good for you. Good for you. I certainly like that. All right. Have we have we spoken with everybody? I haven't left anyone out, have I? If I have, please, please speak up. Hello. Um gosh, I I would say the unique thing about me is my ability to to hold a whole lot without spontaneously combusting or <laughs> discorporating <laughs> it's the simplest way i would describe it my experience in this lifetime this incarnation um i i'm bringing a lot with me i feel from past lifetimes astrologically speaking i'm living a karmic reaping lifetime um closing some the loops of some old ways of doing things um, and figuring out how to do things better, including my own family, intergenerational cycles of violence. Uh, myself and a couple of my siblings are, you know, changing things. And you. I, I have a deep investment in understanding all the weirdness of being human and coming from a Buddhist perspective, yoga perspective all these things. I'm soon going to start my bodywork practice finally after COVID delays. And I am very invested in loving myself and loving others and just figuring out how to make the most out of the weirdness of being human. So <laughs> that's my best summary. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I understand weirdness. That's I feel like I'm just weirdness. Right, right. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> All right, and I have not left anyone out. I can't, I'm trying to see. Uh, I'm not really good at working the Zoom. Oh, oh Dia, is that correct? Great, thank you. Yeah, yes, okay. please. Well, I'll be quick because I'm excited to hear what you have. And, and hi, Gail, nice to meet you face to face. I got um, your um, newly dead game a couple of years ago and we did that here in Rochester, Minnesota. I see myself as a death educator. I retired last year after 32 years of um, being a licensed acupuncturist. And I guess, I don't know, that's not particularly unique, but um, I have done, followed my own heart for um, my, my life. And uh, that might be unique. And that is very unique. A lot that of is people. very unique. Most people don't. So good for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. There's and one more, uh, Petra, uh, Nancy Clam has her camera on. Nancy, would you yes. like to speak? Hi, am I unmuted? You're unmuted. Hello. Okay. Um, hi. My, I think that my unique quality is the, my quest for education and quest for always wanting to know more. I don't really even care what it's about, but I'm always digging to find answers to things. I'm a person that has patience beyond belief. And that really helps in doing education of teaching people about death, death and dying and so forth. Wonderful. Got it for me. You're a very curious mind. So. Good for you. Mm -hmm. All right. How are you? You're on the move. Yeah, she is. <laughs> I'm at Fairview Cemetery because I, I can't make it tomorrow night. I have to fly out. So I came up here today. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, go to the go to the side where all the dirt and tumbleweeds are. That's my part. <laughs> okay, I will. I plan on walking the whole thing. <laughs> okay, 
this is why I asked you guys why, why you were, what made you all extraordinary? Because, you know, oftentimes when I speak to people um, about their obituaries and what we do is we get like a call in that somebody has died and they want a custom obituary. And then we call the family and we have a discussion with the family about um, who is, you know, the deceased and, and their life and so on. And a lot of times people can't put into words what it is that makes their loved one extraordinary um, or let alone themselves. You know, so this is a question that that comes up often. And, and I always like to start with it. You know, what what is it that you remember the most about the person who has died? And, and what is it that you like the best if I'm working with people who are writing their own? What do you like the best about yourself? What makes you a good person? And, and I don't think that often, well, I don't think that we ever really get a chance to answer that question, you know, where we're so busy taking care of others in our lives or, or telling other people, you know, our, our spouses, our mates, our children, our families, you know, you're extraordinary for this reason, or you're wonderful for that reason. But no one ever says, what, what do you think about you? You know, what makes you, um, what makes you so unique? What makes you so special? What do you like most about yourself? Um, and, and that trips up a lot of people. So it was, it was nice that, that a lot of you were, were right on top of things. Um, and this is important because what you don't recognize is that, you know, Bob, you are much more than your collection of harmonica boxes. And I'm certain that while that is the most extraordinary facet that, that, that sort of points out and speaks to your personality and, and how you live your life and, and how you, um, how you've sort of built up this, this really amazing thing to share with other people. I'm certain that there's other people who would answer that question um, about you completely different, who wouldn't even mention the harmonica boxes. Like that would be the least extraordinary part of your life for them. Um, and, and Chris, you're, you know, living this, this karmic life and, 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 you know, with love and patience and, and doing all these really wonderful things for yourself. And it sounds like for you with your family as well. Um, I'm certain that other people in your life look at you and they don't see any of that, but they see something else that's extraordinary, right? They see beyond that one thing that you think defines you. So sometimes I think we define ourselves very well. Um, I would say probably the most extraordinary thing about myself is that um, I'm a very good writer and I started publishing when I was in my teens and, and getting paid for it. I started my professional life then. But I think a lot of other people don't even see my writing and they might see something else in me that's extraordinary. You know, um, maybe I'm a good friend um, or a good daughter or, or a good sister or something of that nature. I don't know. Um, I've never asked them the question, you know, but unfortunately, you know, so many people don't. And the first thing to starting an obituary, the first thing to thinking about yourself and in the, the terms that you should be thinking of yourself is asking, what is it? What do you like about me? You know, what is it? How do you feel about me? Tell me what, tell me your best memory of me. Um, you know, I've got a girlfriend and we go back to, to grade school together. We got confirmed together. And so we've been best friends for a very long time. And the thing um, that I think she would probably tell me that's most extraordinary about me is the ability to tolerate her own humor. So, you know, I think that speaks to our friendship, right? So I would start by gathering perspectives. Ask people, you know, it's, it, and it's hard to do so because it, it seems like it's a very um, self-serving, um, you know, what do I want to say? Uh, and just self-serving sort of activity, but it's one that needs to be done. If you don't know what people think of you, then number one, you don't have a good sense of your own self-worth, but also two, you know, how can you be a better person? 
how can you grow? How can you continue to grow as a person if people aren't providing you feedback? And, and one of the first things that you have to do when thinking about your, your end of life and how you want to be remembered is, is ask people how they're remembering you now. What, what are they thinking? What's extraordinary about you? What's unique? What do they love the most about you? Um, and, and I think that you will be very surprised um, by the answers that you get. Um, Dal and Pat, I love that you guys are Austin fans and, and she's, she's my world, you know, she's my world. Um, but I think other people would, would probably say something quite different and, and look at the two of you and say, you know, this, this dream that you've built, this thing that you've created, that's affected me in this way or your kindness has given me this, or your love has allowed me to do this sort of thing. I was having a conversation with my mom yesterday and um, my mom's very, very pragmatic and I'm very creative. I, I don't have a practical bone in my body whatsoever. And, and my mom is, is quite opposite. And you know, she was, she was talking to me about something and she sort of expressed that, you know, I, I always tried to make things, she said, just to save money. You know, if we could make our own clothes, if we could make our own costumes, if we could make, um, you know, whatever we needed, if we could make it, you know, then it, it saved the family money, she said. But I don't know if anyone ever, ever um, thought about that. I don't know if anyone ever recognized that I was doing that. And I said, I, I recognized, I recognized from a young age. I was like, mom, you fed my creativity because you were always making things, you showed me that I can create. And I use that, that idea of, of, of sewing, of making, of building, of saving to foster my own creativity in many, many ways. And she said, you know, never really looked at it like that. And I said, well, maybe I should have, I should have told you sooner, right? <laughs> so these are the conversations that we need to have. You know, we, we should be we should be able to ask people, hey, I want you to tell me something. What do you think? You know, what do you think about me when you remember, you know, when we're apart? What do you think about me? How do you feel? What makes me unique? What's your favorite memory of me? And use that as a jumping point for how you start to think of yourself in this, in this journey for not only writing your own obituary, but for, for living the rest of your lives, actually. Um, we have to think about the people that we've touched in our lives and the people who are who are most meaningful to us in our lives. And again, I think that um, a lot of us don't realize the number of people that we impact on a daily basis or or even just once in our lives that we've impacted. Um, I, I have a, I'm a very, I'm, I'm very creative, like I said, I write. And for a time, I was also um, putting myself through college as a semi-professional musician. Now, Bob, I didn't play the harmonica, unfortunately, but I played the clarinet. And so I was very involved in classical music. And when I went to school, I, would, um, I was like uh, sort of a clarinet for hire. So if there were universities that needed someone to sit in, they needed a strong clarinet in a certain part. Um, orchestras, bands, marching bands, whatever. Um, you know, I was down south and I played with the Charlotte Symphony on a few occasions when they needed an extra, an extra clarinet. So that's how I kind of put my life together. And then um, I came back to performing regularly after my father passed away. And I met up again with my former band director from high school who was my mentor during that time. And uh, we, uh, we started playing together again and we got some small ensembles involved. It was a really moving time for me. And then he died quite suddenly and unexpectedly. And that was about 20 years ago. And I cannot stop thinking about him, about the influence he had on my life, how he affected me, how he, always pushed me, the opportunities that he gave to me to expand my world, to, to become the person that I am, the advice that he would give me. And I was just every other student to him, every other student. 
But years after his death, I still think about him and quite regularly. And I miss him. I mourn him. Um, he never had children. He was never married. He lived a very quiet life um, that was based around school and the church. And I'm sad that I never told him any of this while he was still living. Because I don't think he would have known that years after his death, that there's somebody who still thinks about him so profoundly as I do. Um, he's really a, a remarkable person. And if we don't let people know, and if people don't tell us, we don't get this sort of sense. And so this is what your obituary is. It's not, you know, I lived this many years, I died, I was born on this day, I was died on this day, I, I did this as a career, and I had some children, and these are the people who are left that I've had a hand in creating. You know, we're more than that. We are far more than that death notice. And I urge you to talk to people to get a better sense of who you are. I think I know myself fairly well, um, but I know that in talking to people, I would get some really interesting <laughs> and differing opinions on what makes me me. And isn't that the stuff of life, right? It's the way that we've impacted others, the way that we've befriended others, the way that we've loved others. That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us extraordinary. And coupled with all these other things that we do. And so I would urge you to just have open and honest conversations going into this process. And because you're here, because you've taken the time to be here, because you've taken the time to sit here and learn about this and, and attend this conference, I know that you have interest in doing these things. Now, just take the next step. After today, make a list of people that you need to phone or people that you need to visit and say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. I wanna to talk to you about my life and I wanna to talk to you about me. Could, would you mind just telling me what, why you love me or why you're my friend? What, what makes me special to you? Those are the kinds of questions that I urge you to ask at the onset of these things, okay? So make that list and then get in touch with those people and talk to those people. How many years, I, I don't have children, but I have cats. Um, and I know that I spend several hours a day telling them how much I love them and how important they are to me. So I can only imagine with children how much more one does. I would urge you to ask your children, what is it that you love about me? Why do you love your mom? Why do you love dad? What makes me a great grandfather? You know, why do you, why do you smile when I enter the room? You know, these are the things that, that we need to know as humans. And we spend so much time thinking that, oh, we don't need to know these things. We just need to give love and give love. And yeah, people love us, but you know, it's, it's, it's not seen as, um, I don't know if people regard it differently if you're asking people for feedback about yourself, but, but we need that. And if we're not getting it actively, um, we need to ask. So I would urge you to, to make a list of people that you need to get in touch with and ask them what they think about you. And also make that separate list of people that you wanna get in touch with and tell them what you think about them. Um, it's gonna be very important for them to hear it very important. Um, people that I've written obituaries for, it's been a, um, it's been a very interesting process. I once spoke to a man who, um, who couldn't speak to me about his wife. He had a very hard time talking about her, loved her so much and kept saying she was so extraordinary, so extraordinary. And he used that word. She was so extraordinary. And he said just everything that she did, the cooking, the raising of the children, just our friends and, and creating a life for the two of us, she was extraordinary. And then he stopped talking and he started crying. And then he said to me, why do you think she loved me? Why did that extraordinary woman love me? Why me? And then I started crying. <laughs> as I'm about to do now, remembering it. And I said, you know, it's been my experience that extraordinary people only love other extraordinary people. And then he just took a deep breath and then he just started talking about her. It was gone, you know, he, he got it. She was with me 
because I am extraordinary, because I am a wonderful, magical, beautiful person. And that's why this lovely woman was with me. And once he understood that, he was able to talk about her so freely. And, and we really got a great, a great story out of that. Um, I had another woman that um, I, I spoke with, this really incredible family. Um, this was not too long ago. This was just maybe, mm, I wanna say a month and a half ago. So like six weeks. It was a family and the mother had passed away. She was a Holocaust survivor. And she had lived in, grown up in Poland and spent the first basically, you know, eight years of her life. Well, she was in like five or six. And then, um, you know, then Germany invaded Poland. And from that time on, the next eight years, she spent living in a hole in the ground underneath a shack um, in somebody's backyard. Um, and that's where they would hide. Um, she and her grandmother and her mother. And they lived in in squalor, complete squalor. It was, um, it was, you know, it was not, it was not nice, none of it. And they lived there for, for several years. And um, she came over to America and met this really wonderful man. And they got married and they started this business, which they then expanded into this really incredible um string of businesses they own the largest uh the largest privately owned um string of pawn shops in in the world and then they sold this business uh not too long ago for a whole bunch like just millions and millions of dollars and then they spent the rest of their lives traveling back to israel um they you know and educating people on on the holocaust in um they're from nevada so in nevada and that's what they spent all their money on that not on cars and boats and clothes and stuff they they spent it on um on education and and it was just a really wonderful wonderful story how they were able to overcome that thing in their life right and not let it define them but let it push them into something something more extraordinary something more special and maybe on a larger scale or maybe on what we may think a lesser scale we all have that story we all have that thing that pushes us right the thing that pushes us into who we are and that that should be part of your obituary because that's part of who you are right it's not just who we've become it's that journey all the way from childhood, you know, through our through our deaths. That's who we become. And, and that has to be part of your story too. Um, my best friend had a son um, who died at age 11 and I wrote that obituary. And when I went to the funeral, they had all the, um, it was an open casket and so tiny little casket. And then the whole front row of seats was um, all of his favorite stuffed animals and um, his favorite superheroes, all in the first row of seats. And then everyone sat behind that. And it was it was a heavy, heavy funeral um, to go to because it was just this little boy and they had it. It looked like a birthday party with balloons and the stuffed animals and things. And his casket was, you know, he had his favorite doll with him. Um, but what made it wonderful was the obituary and um, I wrote it, but it's not because of my writing. It's because um, it just it it just lightened the mood to talk about this, the, you know, the favorite toys and then the the memories of going to the beach or down to Disney World or or skateboarding with Dad or or carving pumpkins or or the different costumes you wore for Halloween. And that was the obituary. It, it wasn't an extraordinary piece of writing. It was just a sort of written list of of things that this boy enjoyed doing, how this boy lived his life, and you know what was started off as tears turned into laughter and into smiles and into applause because people recognize the memory and then they would start oh yeah i remember that and they would clap and you know they're shaking their hands and everyone is smiling and that's what it became um and so i would urge you when you think about your obituary to think about it in in those ways what 
what are some of the best times that you shared with other people? Um, those are the things that they're going to they're going to react to. Those are the things that they're going to remember too. Um, excuse me, I have to adjust here for a second. Um, you know, what are what are your your favorite memories of being with other people? It can be something so mundane that one Thanksgiving dinner where the turkey was burnt and everything turned out, you know, completely shitty and nobody wanted to eat and we ended up getting takeout like pizza because it was so terrible right or it could be that really lovely um you know sunday morning you know that that you took a walk and and you you met your neighbors and you know you guys just stood there in the park talking you know for for an hour and oh wasn't it great to catch up together and and how meaningful that was and and i mean these these memories may seem small to you but they're big to other people Believe me, they're very big to other people. So if you can find some way as you're creating this list that I'm urging you to do of writing down the people that you need to, to talk to about who you are, the people that you want to talk to to make sure they know who they are. Um, and then you want to start adding these, these very important memories, right? What was, what was my favorite Thanksgiving? What was my favorite time with my cousins? How did I, what was... What made Christmas so special? Or why was that uh, bar mitzvah so amazing? Was it the centerpieces that, that Lauren's making? Or, you know, what, what made that outstanding, right? And I, I think that just start making these lists. The obituary doesn't have to be a one complete document, right? Just, just start with these lists, right? Get yourself thinking, start writing things down. What do you like most about living, you know, like um, Dal and Pat, do you guys love just sitting on the couch watching, you know, Pride and Prejudice, uh, you know, film or, and, you know, like reading an Austin book or, or maybe visiting your home in England or, <clears throat> you know, like that memory may seem mundane. We're just sitting down watching TV, but it's very special because you're sharing something. And as long as we can just think of ourselves as always sharing, we're always experiencing, we're always sharing, no matter what it is that we do, always, you know, then we can begin to think about ourselves a little bit differently and more objectively in order to put this whole thing together. So make those three, <clears throat> excuse me, make those three lists, right, to get yourself thinking. And then um, you really want to talk about in your obituary, no matter how you do it. And we'll talk about the form in a second, but some of you may not be great writers. Some of you may pick up a pen and pencil and barely, you know, able to scratch out your, you know, your name on there. And I know people like this. Some of you are extraordinary writers. Some of you it's passable, whatever. Your obituary does not have to be written. It doesn't have to be a written document. It can just be a collection of you just a collection of you. How do we do that? Well, um, you know, it can be a collection of, you know, bits of film, right? It can be a slideshow of photos. It can be, as Bob has, a collection of harmonica cases. That, that expresses who he is. And maybe if you added context to that in some way, Bob, this is, this is what the harmonicas mean to me. This is what the cases mean. This is what it meant for me to, to start this and why I kept pursuing it so ardently. And this is what I feel when I know that it's being exhibited in a museum. And this is how, how I'm filled with such pride when I can say, you know, look me up, Google me, I'm everywhere, right? Like those are the sorts of things that, that you collect and then somehow express that. So, <clears throat> Excuse me, my obituary, I think, is, is going obviously going to be written because that is that is what I do. You know, that's all that I do. So it's going to be a written document. But I know people who have filmed themselves speaking about their lives. I know people who have just displayed co their collection um, at like a memorial. And then everyone who comes to the memorial takes a piece of that collection away. And that becomes part of their collection at their home, right? And so that can be a way that you express yourself in an obituary. Um, 
you can record a statement, just record your voice. You can, um, you know, write down a list of things that you love in hopes that other people will experience these same things one day. I really loved my vacations in Florida, you know, going to the park with my grandchildren, um, you know, making this certain meal for my, for my, uh, my children, uh, you know, doing this thing with my spouse and you're just writing a list and maybe at your memorial, this list is given out and and with the instructions that say, do these things, make your own list and get to it now because life is short, right? Like that can be an obituary. It doesn't have to be this very traditional sort of thing, right? That, that, that we read in the newspaper or that, <clears throat> excuse me, that people, um, you know, read out loud at, at a memorial. It has to just express you, whomever you are, and however you want to do it. That is all that it needs to be. That's the only rule, that it speaks to who you are. Because if it doesn't speak to who you are, then it's not going to impact people, right? So, you know, if, if I'm at my mom's, you know, memorial, and I'm, I'm reading this, you know, this thing that's very, that's very much in the style of Petra, it's not going to impact people because that's not who my mom was. She was much different. So we're going to work together and figure out something that speaks to her. My father's obituary was, um, was very humorous and very honest, just like my dad was. And um, I, I managed to take shots in the obituary at different organizations with um, whom he had a beef. And uh, I also managed to get in a few, a few pot shots at some people that had, that had angered him, just like my dad would have done, just like he would have done. And that's why I wrote it that way. And it was all in good humor. Like it wasn't nasty. Uh, it was funny, <laughs> but it was all in good humor. And that's who my dad was. You know, a lot of people remember my dad as being an extraordinarily funny guy. To me, he was something quite different. But I remember um, getting a, a card in the mail. Um, my father was in, you know, given six weeks to live after being diagnosed with brain cancer. And then he um, was in the hospital and decided to decline treatment. And they just wanted to be taken back home and just remain at home with his family. And that's all he wanted. And while he was in the hospital, he had a roommate come in and the roommate was dying. Roommate was dying of lung cancer, constantly, constantly coughing and hacking and moaning and groaning. And my his family would be over there, right? And just partitioned by a curtain. And the man's family would come in and visit and the guy would start hacking and coughing. And my dad would be like, shut up over there. It sounds like you're gonna die. You know, like just he's horrible that I'm like, dad, you can't just, just don't. Like, why are you? why are you saying this like I would be like coughing some more he's like I can't even talk and my dad would be like you what are you gonna croak in the next bed like is you know like and if you're gonna do it do it soon you're interrupting my stuff and he'd just be like there's just horrible stuff right and I'm like oh my god I can't like the sooner we get dad out of here the better I got a card from that family after my dad passed away and they said I don't know if we could have gotten through my father's death if it wasn't for your father in the next bed shouting out stupid shit the entire time we were at the hospital. You, I mean, and I was like reading this, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is astounding. And they were like, no, I mean, they had it all, you know, it, they made us laugh. He took our minds off things just in those moments when we were most sad. He reminded us of the imminent but somehow it was funny. And there we were just laughing at this goofball in the next, and I thought, my God, I didn't even know my dad was doing this, this person such a service, you know? And my dad was just screwing around, just being an idiot. And, um, and it worked and he must've known something. He must've heard them laughing or, or something because I got that card and it was remarkable to know that that my dad's stupidity had brought this family through a really, really terrible time. <laughs>
So, and what a wonderful thing for them to give me, right? So that's why I'm urging you to tell people what you think about them, urging you. So <clears throat> that's how I did my dad's obituary. I couldn't have done it any other way than to just be humorous. And it was published in the paper in a very small um, northern Michigan town. And I told them that either you're printing this in its entirety or not printing it at all, because my dad was this person and, and people are going to react to it. And they did. Um, people to this day still talk about uh, that particular obituary. So whatever it is that you're going to do, make sure that it speaks to you. You know, the video, if you're going to just talk to people, just a voice recording, if you're going to put together a collection and tell people why you've done it, if you're going to assemble photos and say, these are the, the best times of my life, if you're going to put together a scrapbook of all your favorite things. I love donuts and cats and pizza and, you know, bonfires, like then do that because people will remember those things about you. And that can be an obituary. It doesn't have to be something that's, you know, written from beginning to end. That's why I started this company because I'm, I'm a writer who can do that for people, you know, written. I can, I can translate that. But oftentimes, if you don't have that skill, you can't. So I would urge you to do something which speaks about you to others that works for you. Um, there is a little um, list, well, it's not little, it is actually a few pages long. That's in the, am I right in saying this is in the chat area? It's been, it's been shared in the chat. Excellent. It's been shared in the chat. This is also new to me. I'm, I'm so not technological. Um, Dal and Pat, if I had my way, I would still be living in the Regency um, and definitely not, not in this era. Um, so yeah, I include a bunch of stuff and this is, it just, it looks like this and you guys will be able to see it later. <clears throat> and at the very top, I, I write general outline, who, what, where, when, and how, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's just if you want to do a written. And then I just get into these questions. You know, who has been the most important in your life? What's the happiest moment? Saddest? Who's been most kind to you? When have you felt the most alone? Sometimes those experiences speak of who we are, right? I got hit by a truck once crossing the street and I was thrown like 20 feet. And I was all alone after that, that accident. And I had to recover by myself. And it was really traumatic, but it taught me a lot about who I am. And I still refer to that period in time, even though it's long since past. So that moment, you know, made me. Um, and then it's just like growing up, your family heritage, school. So just a bunch of questions, um, you know, that, that may help you form other questions or form something that's more, um, you know, that, that works for you as a person. Maybe it's not written, maybe it is. Um, but I would definitely tell you to start making the lists. That's number one. Start making the lists and answer the questions. And then things will start to come together, right? Then you'll see, you'll see the patterns, you'll see the people, and you'll figure out how you want to, how you want to manage it all. Um, so I think we have a few minutes left, if I'm correct. Um, if anyone would like to answer. Uh, Bob, Bob uh, Hoff, Hoff has a question for you. Please. <laughs> or harmonica guy. Yes. So um, I guess I got a little bit confused because the way that you're using the term obituary yes. is, much, is much more uh, generic and encompassing than the way I use the word obituary. Yes. I've written an obituary and I've also written a lot of other things like life reviews and love letters and legacy things and transition notes, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I'm not asking opinions of other people about my obituary. I'm writing my own obituary based upon what I wanted to say. Okay. But, I'm, but they have plenty, plenty of opportunity to praise me or whatever they want to do in many other formats that I have, I don't call it my obituary. I call it more of my legacy. 
which is different ways that they can uh, opine on me and my life. But my obituary is very specific because it's going to appear in various periodicals and newspapers, and I want it to be in a controlled environment. All those other things you're talking about, which I think are wonderful, I've done videos as well, but I don't call that my obituary per se, because it's confusing to me to use that term in the way normally it's used. Right. Well, I mean, I think that's that's problematic of our our language. You know, we don't we don't we don't have many terms for love and we don't have many terms for obituary other than saying like a key phrase like life story or a legacy or a memorial. But those speak to other things as well. Right. So, yeah, I'm opening up this this definition of the word um, and opening it up to to however one wants to interpret it. I, I think that's the best way to do it. And I know that these days <clears throat> many people are not getting their obituaries printed. Um, they're not putting them in newspapers. They're not, you know, they're not putting them in that that traditional publishing source. So that's why I urge people to do other things because that that source is is not not available to many people financial, you know, for financial reasons. They're expensive. Um, they are yeah. very expensive. Very, they're they're too expensive. You know, oh. and these are the stories that I think are most important in our world, and we're. We've we've basically written them out of the papers because we demand too much money now. So, yeah. Well, Petra, this has <laughs> been a great sharing of information. Thank you so much. Oh well, I'm I'm glad that that I that I could help, and I'm glad that that I I'm here. Before I go, there's something that I want to show Dale and Pat. It's right over here. That's why I'm showing it to him. This is my Mr. Darcy bust. Oh, I have from from the 2005 film. I just I'm sorry when I every time I hear Jane Austen, I have to I have to react. That so, is great. Well, yeah. Petra, thank you so much for taking the time to share this information with us. And if people want to get more information, your website is beloved dashpress.com. That is correct. Yep, absolutely. Yep. And and feel free to email um, with any questions or whatever. I'm here to help people as well. So if you guys um, want to talk about it or um, if you need a little bit more help, um, please, I'm, I'm available for any of it. Can I run my friend's obituary by you for a... Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Well, this concludes this uh, particular session at the Before I Die New Mexico Festival.